Hello everybody and greetings from Washington, the evergreen state. Today we're going to Seattle, also known as Emerald City, and we're going to do all the touristy things, including visiting Fraser Crane, well, sort of. We'll go to the top of the Space Needle, the Museum of Pop Culture, the Amazon Spheres, also known as Bezos Balls, Pike Place Market, where the original Starbucks is located, We'll try and see the home of the one who couldn't sleep. We'll stop by the Ballard Locks. And eventually, we might get lucky and get a clear day so we can see Mount Rainier. Yep, this one is gonna be action-packed. I'm riding, 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 riding in my RV, my RV wherever I want to be. Cause I'm free in my RV yeah. well, That was uh, $12 with my four axles for the Tacoma Narrows Bridge here coming up. As I said, going to Seattle. Ely is flying in tomorrow, so we're gonna spend a few days together. We might even drive up to Vancouver, but first, it was inevitable. As soon as we approach Tacoma, it is bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, as is usually the case with most major metropolitan areas. And the Seattle-Tacoma area here? Mm, no different. Ooh, rest area. Free coffee. Mm, I gotta check that out. Ooh, and multiple dump stations. I like it. Well, I saw a sign that said free coffee, so it's one of those they had me at hello things. And nice rest area here in Washington in the Tacoma area. They even have a they even have a dump station. Several of them. So it is true. That's true that the uh, Washington rest rest areas are very RV friendly. In fact, they have signs, cars prohibited in the RV areas, and it's only RVs, not no commercial vehicles. Commercial vehicles have to go on the other side. You see the SeaTac rest area. Nice covered picnic tables, but I see no sign of the coffee. Oh no. I guess timing is everything. They're closed and they will return at 6.30 a.m. So, let's continue. We're only like 20 minutes away from the KOA. Here we are, the Seattle-Tacoma KOA journey. It is a city campground, so the sights are a little tight, but it is totally adequate for what we want. Let's hit the pool. It is a KOA, all right. The main building gives it away. And uh, it looks like they might have movie night. There's a screen here and... Uh, in any case, it is pretty nice. Especially since this is a KOA journey, which I recently learned it's like the lower end of KOAs. But aside from the tight spot, this has everything we need. Which reminds me, I gotta do laundry soon. Maybe tonight. Oh yes, this looks very inviting. It is kind of a warm day. Well, that was refreshing. Now let me get everything ready, clean the RV, because Ely is flying in tomorrow. I might even get a haircut. In any case, see you then. All right, let's make a modified picadillo. So there's something to eat when Ely arrives. Okay, this is to make the rice later on. Now let's make this very highly unorthodox picadillo today. I've got like a brick of frozen ground beef, which is not ideal, but it'll thaw eventually. Boom. I'll start defrosting while I chop the onions and the garlic. Lots of garlic, lots of garlic. It's getting there. Let's add the onions and the garlic so we can saute them together with the meat. Sure, why not? I got a good deal on it. Let's make sure it's good because we wouldn't want to cook with something we wouldn't drink, right? Oh yeah, we got some green peas, multicolored peppers. A little bit of that Chandon Brut, not too much. And this is the thing, I ran out of that Vino Seco cooking wine I usually use. This is the unorthodox part, we're gonna add some organic garbanzo beans or chickpeas. 
a little bit of tomato sauce and uh, here's the final product. Seattle, here we come! Always exciting to explore a new city. First thing we're going to do is look for a good vantage point from which to see the city. And for that, we need to hit the high ground, so we're going up Queen Anne Hill. Cool, they have these electric buses. This is it, right here to the left. Let's find parking. Well, here we are at Kerry Park, arguably one of the best views. piece of modern art. This was actually the view from Fraser Crane's fictitious condo in the 1990s sitcom Fraser. One of my favorites. Well, this uh, here where we're standing is called Kerry Park and it's probably one of the best views you can get of Seattle. If you want to get that money shot, you know, that Instagram uh, picture, this is probably one of the best places to see it. Let's continue. There it is, the Space Needle. Well, we parked right here in this uh, gentrified neighborhood here, $2, $2 an hour. So, let's go explore. That's where we're going. Check it out! People camping in a city park. That's odd. We're going up. Silly. You have these machines here where you can get your tickets with the time. It's a good way to avoid making the line. That's a pretty sizable gift shop down there. And they have all these exhibits about the construction of the tower which is a good way to pass the time while we make our way towards the elevators. Check your watches because this will take only about 41 seconds. If you look behind me, you see Seattle's historic Queen Anne District. That big building in the back is the first high school in all of Seattle. All right, I hope you guys have a great day here at the Space Needle. If you have any questions, it's now too late to ask because we are at the top. Here we are. Arguably the most iconic tourist attraction here in Seattle. They have a cafeteria and a wine bar. But first, let's step outside. That is what we came here to do, after all. Let's see the view from 520 feet, which translates to 160 meters up in the air. The Space Needle here was built for the 1962 World's Fair. At the time, the tallest structure west of the Mississippi. That's the Museum of Pop Culture down there. And the Sleepless in Seattle house is somewhere out there.
Let's go to the Mopop, the Museum of Pop Culture. That's a cool structure, it looks like an ear from the inside, or maybe not. The first gallery here is dedicated to horror films. I was never a big fan of the genre, but of course I can recognize most of the references, especially those from the 80s. That's an actual costume from the 2009 version of Friday the 13th. The next section is dedicated to science fiction. This is more my kind of thing. Although, let me tell you, Terminator almost straddles that line between horror and sci-fi. They have a bunch of Star Wars stuff, and War of the Worlds, and Star Trek, of course. Ooh, hoverboards. They have quite the collection of artifacts. I could stay here forever, but let's continue. I can't decide whether this looks cool or like a nightmare. Anyways, this is the Pearl Jam section. Of course, Pearl Jam formed here in Seattle back in 1990 and still going. Yeah, that was a pretty cool exhibit. It's a hidden door. There's a section about fantasy. Now, this is really my bit. When I was growing up, young adult, it was always my dream to work on one of these. Of course, nowadays I have most of these controls in software inside my computer, more capable in many ways, but there is something special, something to be said for the pristine quality and tactile feel of a high-end analog mixing console. This is of course the Jimi Hendrix section, another Seattle native, and the console we saw was actually built to his specifications for the Electric Lady Studios, later to be used by the likes of Led Zeppelin, Stevie Wonder, David Bowie, and wow! That's a lot of guitars. There we've got the indie game revolution. Pretty cool. Let's continue. Guitar Gallery. I always wanted to have a Les Paul. Cool, Prince! Finally, there's a section dedicated to Nirvana, and let me tell you, when we tend to think of American music, the first thing that comes to mind is Tennessee. Mississippi even has it on their state sign, the birthplace of American music. Otherwise, it is either New York or California, right? And sometimes we don't realize how much great music came from this northwestern corner of the lower 48. They have this sound lab here. They even have some studio booths. And you know, I had to do my signature tumbao, right? That salsa piano riff. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I liked it. Really cool museum, if you are into this sort of thing. And here's the equally cool control booth. Let's continue. The rest of Seattle awaits. This city is definitely a visual and sonic experience. This park is called Artist at Play. And uh, as I've said before, I really like cities with street musicians. Here we stumble upon the International Fountain, which is pretty cool. And um, is that a shark fin? They have a bunch of these sculptures all over the park. The fountain, by the way, was also built for the 1962 World's Fair. Actually, what we really want is something to eat. And Dick's here seems to be a famous local fast food chain. And as you know, 
I'm kind of on this quest to try local fast food from different parts of the country. The small drink is really small. The fries, they're okay. And the burger, overall, I wasn't too impressed. Let's go back and get the truck and drive to a different area, a little more downtown. We're looking for some parking and everything around here seems to be a two-hour limit. And uh, check it out, Pike Place Market. This one is one of the most famous landmarks here. Hmm, perhaps driving down here wasn't the brightest idea. We're definitely not gonna find parking. There's the original Starbucks, naturally with the original logo. And that's a long line to get a doppio of espresso. Let's go back up and see if we can find some reasonably priced parking. This is one steep hill. Some of these garages say monthly only, so... What is one to do if all you want is a few hours? More than two, but less than 24. This one is $4 an hour. Let's keep looking. I'm sure we can find a better deal. Traffic in downtown Seattle, by the way, pretty chaotic. It'll definitely give Miami and Atlanta a run for their money. But being familiar with the city also adds to the experience, I guess. All right, I can't do this anymore. Let's park and walk around a little bit. Amazon headquarters is nearby and the famous Amazon Spheres. Yeah, it is a very vibrant city, for sure. What is that? In any case, here we are, Amazon headquarters and the Amazon spheres, also known colloquially as Bezos balls. And let me tell you, I wish we could go inside, but they are mainly reserved for Amazon employees, unless you book one of the tours, which we didn't. They do the tours only twice a month anyways, every other Saturday, I believe. Inside, it's like a greenhouse with thousands of plants and also many employee lounges and workspaces and coffee shop, that sort of thing. They have pretty nice outdoor common areas here as well. I guess the reward for working for the richest man in the world. Well, since we can't go inside, let's do the next best thing and visit the Amazon Go store which is at this point mostly a concept, I think. But the idea is you grab whatever you want and just go out. And somehow they know what you bought and they charge you for it. It's mostly food, I guess. Wine. They have wine. Apparently they have a bunch of cameras and sensors to figure out who bought what. It's pretty cool. We just went here to the Amazon Go store and it's really cool actually you just scan your way in with your phone and then you grab whatever you want and you walk out and somehow magically they know what you bought so it's like magic Let's go down to the market. Wow, 16% grade was that street. That's pretty steep. Hmm, someone's flying a drone. You know, birds always go crazy when they see a drone. And they have this totem pole here. And here's a nice view of Elliott Bay and Alaskan Way and the partially demolished Alaskan Way viaduct. 
Apparently, besides being an eyesore, it was vulnerable to earthquakes, so they replaced it with a tunnel. Let's check it out. According to the Book of Knowledge, also known as Wikipedia, this is Seattle's most popular tourist destination, and it is the 33rd most visited tourist attraction in the world. 33, the magic number. Well, this is the line to go into the original Starbucks here. In 1971, three friends decided to sell high-quality coffee, beans, and roasting equipment, and in 1976, they moved their store here. And yes, the mermaid used to be topless. Let's walk around the market a little bit. They have all kinds of stuff, but we must be in the wrong part, because I recall seeing pictures with lots of fish and seafood. Let's walk on the street instead. There's a Beecher's Handmade Cheese. I guess that's how you make cheese by hand? And do I hear a street musician? Sure do! His name is Johnny Han, and apparently he's quite an institution here in Pike Place. I read somewhere he's been doing this since 1986, rolling his piano from a nearby secret location to this very corner. That was delightful. Here we've got lots of fruits and the seafood. Oh, the seafood. Oysters. Look at those salmons and the king crab. Let me tell you, now I really wish we were hungry. I really wish we hadn't eaten that burger. Hmm, magnets. I think this might be the main part of the market. What's going on here? Oh, they are scaring the customers. <laughs> Apparently, it's a thing. Oh, brewery. Let's check it out. The Pike Pub. We could use a couple of IPAs, let me tell you. Well, it turns out there was no room at the bar and we don't feel like sitting at a table ordering food, but behind the brewery there's another attraction. Why is this famous is beyond my comprehension, but it is called the Gum Wall. And yeah, it's a wall covered in chewing gum. And you can see lots of people come to see it. Well, yeah, that is kind of gross, so um, moving right along. The bike brewing, one of these days we're gonna come back. Tell you what, we were gonna continue exploring the city until sundown, maybe have dinner at one of these places, but we've decided to save something for another day. We're gonna go back to the campground in the SeaTac area and we're going to eat at this restaurant in the city of Des Moines, Washington, not Iowa. Actually, near the barber shop where I had my haircut yesterday, should be a nice, relaxing end to our day. Of course, leaving Seattle, we encounter one of the worst traffic jams I've ever seen. It felt like we were never gonna make it out of the city, but eventually we did.
grab the egg. We got the garlic bread and... <laughs> yeah, good clam chowder. And I've been craving mussels. Tomorrow, we'll continue exploring. Good morning! Okay, this is going to be weird. In reality, today we're going to Canada, to Vancouver, but I want to show you all that on the next episode, so bear with me here. I'll try to make it a seamless transition because we are coming back to Seattle after Vancouver. But first, here in the morning, we're gonna go to this area called Alki Beach. Or is it Alki? Not sure. There's Minitini. We're actually near the spot where the first European settlers arrived on November 13th, 1851. And even though it doesn't look very busy here in the morning, it is supposed to be a popular summer destination. And just like that, it is afternoon on a different day. And now we are going to continue exploring. This area is called Pioneer Square. And today we are going to do it a little bit different. We're going to look for a parking garage. It is Sunday, so it should be a little cheaper, right? Here we go. Eight dollars evenings and weekends. Not exactly a bargain, but we'll take it. Many, many people have recommended this spot here called Ivers Fish Bar. I mean, it's been here since 1938 founded by one Ivor Haglund at the site of his also famous aquarium. We were looking forward to a more sit-down experience, but this is the original, right? I mean, we're sitting right next to a statue of Ivor himself. We are, of course, oblivious to the fact that right next door, that's Ivor's Acres of Clams, the actual set-down restaurant. I'm telling you, no amount of research is ever enough. This would have been much nicer, actually. Here's what's left of the Alaskan Way Viaduct. And that's Smith Tower, we're gonna go there later. But first, let's walk around the Pioneer Square area first. It has a certain Parisian feel to it this part. In any case, this is Seattle's original neighborhood, dating back to 1850s, the birthplace of the city, if you will. Let's go up Smith Tower, which is a historical landmark. Merchant's Cafe. Smith Tower was built in 1914, and there's an observation deck and a speakeasy on the 35th floor. I guess this is what an office looked like back in the day. You know, I love seeing all these old artifacts. An original Victrola. Let's go up to the observation deck. There's the ferry terminal, also known as Kalman Dock. They have all these signs all around explaining what you're seeing, like the Alaska building down there, very old. The Rainier Club, St. James Cathedral, the Columbia Center. On a clear day, you could see the Cascade Mountains. And 
on a clear day you could also see Mount Rainier, apparently. I've tried not to show it too much on the video, but in this area in particular, there's a staggering amount of people experiencing homelessness, which is sad. Lots of people tend camping on the streets and city parks as well. That was a very nice view of the city and we decided not to stay at this peak easy and continue exploring. As you can see, we are not the only tourists. They even have an underground tour that we'll take the next time we come. From an independent tourist perspective, it is so much better to visit the city on a weekend because there's no traffic. Let's park here real quick. This is called Lake Union Park, right here on, uh, you guessed it, Lake Union. Such a beautiful afternoon here in Seattle. This is pretty cool. As we continue north here on West Lake Avenue, we're about to encounter a very famous house, especially for those Tom Hanks or Meg Ryan's fans. Somewhere among all these houseboats is the house belonging to one Sam Baldwin in the 1993 film Sleepless in Seattle. It is supposed to be 2460 West Lake, but it is hard to tell because in the movie, the house was mostly filmed from the opposite vantage point, meaning from the water. Maybe next time we'll take a boat tour. Uh, I think that might be it at the end. Yes, that's it. It is such a beautiful place here with all these houseboats. There. That's a better angle. That's the Sleepless in Seattle house. Let's continue. Let's check out this neighborhood called Fremont. It is supposed to be a bohemian neighborhood, as we can tell by the Fremont Troll sculpture here, located under the Aurora Bridge. You can see it there, clutching an actual Volkswagen Beetle. Even more bizarre than the troll is a statue of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, found in a scrapyard in the former Czechoslovakia and brought to the United States. It is actually privately owned. We've got one more thing we want to see here today and that is the Ballard Locks. And I think we found a boondocking area. Look at all these RVs here on the side of the street. I bet you half of them don't even move anymore. Apparently, it is tolerated. Let's park. The Ballard locks here carry more boat traffic than any other locks in the United States, so if we're lucky, we might be able to see them in action. We might have to hurry. to raise it to this height, from that height. The locks serve as a barrier between Lake Union, which is kind of part of Lake Washington, and the Puget Sound, which is about six feet lower. Besides helping maintain the water level, they prevent the salt water from the sound to come into the lake. Pelicans reach. I think we're gonna call it a night.
afternoon, everybody. And uh, today, actually, I, have, I haven't been filming much. It's been mostly a work day. I did go to the supermarket, did groceries, did laundry. Unfortunately, Ely had to fly back to Miami today, so I'm solo again. By the way, that's an, a huge Amazon fulfillment center there. Uh, but um, all of a sudden I was working, I was editing video and I realized it is, it is turning into a beautiful, clear day, blue skies, barely any cloud in the sky. And I hear on these kinds of days, you, you can usually see uh, Mount Rainier. So that's what I'm going to try to see. So I'm wandering around this residential neighborhood and uh, there. Oh my God. Yeah. It almost looks fake. Yeah, it's one of those things that you see it and you are like, wow. Yeah, it's incredible. You see it? Mount Rainier. You know what? I'm gonna go to Kerry Park. Well, yeah, why don't we end it where we started? But this time, we'll take the iconic picture at Magic Hour with Mount Rainier in the background. How about that? There it is. Oh yeah, I gotta find parking. I had to park a few blocks away today, but I believe the view is going to be worth it. Here's the Kerry Park Vista Point. It almost looks like a mirage, like it's not really there. Since the weather cleared up so much, I decided to come back to Kerry Park. And there it is downtown at Mount Rainier in the background. It is quite an amazing view. And if you squint real hard, you can see the moonrise also. There's a full moon rising. It's quite amazing. I think we can leave now. I'm really glad I came back. So we can end uh, uh, our video more or less where we started it, here at, at Kerry Park in Seattle. And even the moon decided to come out at the right moment. I mean, it's... it's, it's uh... Yeah, you can't really plan these things. Actually, I can't think of a better way to end our visit to the Emerald City. On the next one, we are rewinding three days and we're going to be taking Minitini the trailer into Canada for the first time. We are going to visit Vancouver, of course, and a short day trip to Whistler. Until then, thank you so much for watching and see you on the road. Riding in 